That's great. Thank you very much for the invites and thank you, Tom, for the introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll get started. Uh, and it's a very light start here uh, with two images. So if you've read the abstract uh, of my talk, you'll see that I have talked about jellyfish, which you can see on the left hand side, and an 11th century Japanese novel, right, which actually happens to be the tale of Genji. And so I said they have something to do with neural networks, <laughs> which seems a bit strange, perhaps. Um, now, the jellyfish I'll leave till later. But the tale of Genji uh, is interesting, and it's interesting because the chapter titles are indexed by set partitions. So here you can see a diagram that has 52 set partitions of the set of elements containing one to five. Uh, and if you know about these things, they follow something called the bell numbers. Uh, so just to be absolutely clear what a set partition is, um, let's, let's take this one, for example. Uh, so if we label these one to five, these bars one to five, then what it says is one and five are in the same subset by the sort of bracketing at the top, two and three are in the same subset, and four is in a subset of its own. So there are three subsets. So, it, so we're basically partitioning five, what the set one to five into dis, uh, disjoint subsets. And these subsets we call blocks. And these will be important for what follows in terms of the group equivariant neural networks that I'll look at. So to give you a very brief outline of my talk, um, I'll do a quick review of terminology. So just sort of getting everyone up to speed, you'll probably know most of these things, so I won't spend too long on it. Um, I'll then talk about the research problem that I've looked at, um, a short slide on some of the literature that my work builds on, and then I'll get into the main results. And I'll close with some remarks about practicality um, regarding these neural networks. So review of terminology. So most of you probably know what a neural network is, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to go through it very briefly. So it has a, we have a composition of layer functions. So here's a layer function. And as you can see, data goes in from the bottom and comes out of the top, uh, according to this arrow here. And the data gets passed through a learnable linear layer. So there are going to be some weights right, that we wish to optimize. Um, and the output of that gets passed through some fixed nonlinear layer. And we just compose these layer functions together to get a trainable neural network. Now, also the data that we're going to be interested in has a particular form. And it's very natural because this data comes from physical processes. So you can see here, there's something that we call a K order tensor. Um, so it's Rn tensor K times. And you know, if you're used to PyTorch or something like this, you would have seen data of this sort of format. Um, and we're interested in data like this because we can capture different features in the data, right? And, and the idea is we want to learn from data of this format. So here's a very basic example. Uh, so let's focus on this left-hand graph here, right? So again, from your basic graph theory, you'll know that a graph has nodes and there are undirected edges between nodes. And we can represent this information in terms of a adjacency matrix. So for example, uh, the nodes one and two are connected by an edge. So if you look at this matrix, the one, two entry and the two, one entry both have a one, but one and three do not have an edge, right? It's on this graph. So in the one, three and three, one entries, there are zero and you can sort of fill this out. Now, if we imagine we wanted to sort of learn from this graph, some sort of information from this graph, then we shouldn't really care about how the nodes are labeled in some sense, right? So if we change the labeling, we're going to get a different matrix. Um, but of course, these matrices are related. In fact, they're, the rows and columns are related by the same permutation, right? The permutation that changes the labeling of the graph. And so what I'm trying to say really is that this data has some sort of underlying symmetry, right? It has permutation symmetry. And if we were to want to learn from this, we want to take advantage of that symmetry. So I, I talked about symmetry. And there are many different types of symmetries, right? So permutation symmetry, as we just discussed, or for example, 
rotational symmetry, right? If I have a circle in the plane, 2D plane, I can rotate it around, I still get a circle, or a sphere in 3D plane. Uh, and the classic example from your convolutional neural network type work is if you have a cat in the bottom left-hand corner of your image and you want to learn that it's a cat, it doesn't really matter where it's positioned, right? If I shift it to the top right-hand corner, uh, it's just, I should still learn it's a cat. And so this would be an example of translational symmetry. Now, of course, formally symmetries are given by groups and you all know what a group is, but I've just given the definition here for completeness. Um, so I won't go through this, but the, the main examples that we'll focus on uh, are, are these. And again, you'll probably know most of them, so I won't go through all of them. But uh, for example, we have the symmetric group at the top, right, SN, which are permutations of the set of elements containing one to N. And we're going to write that in this particular sort of bracket notation, this set in this bracketing notation. Um, the other group that will probably be of interest is uh, G the general linear group, GLN, right, which consists of the group of all invertible transformations from RN to RN. And if we pick a basis of RN, we're going to get invertible N by N matrices. And then we get particular subgroups, right? So this particular group, like the orthogonal group, special orthogonal group and the symplectic group, where if we take particular bases, we get these particular restrictions on the matrices that we're allowed in the group. So here and here, for example. Now, again, these groups are sort of abstract. And for our purposes, we can do something relatively clever, which is to consider groups as matrices. And I suppose there are many different ways of doing this, but the way that we'll be interested in is taking something called a group action. So that's where a group acts on a set of elements. Uh, so for example, let's just do the example quickly, where uh, S3, so the permutation group S3, acts on the set of elements one to three by just permuting the elements. And what we can do with this is we can actually form something called a group representation, which is a map. So in this example here, it's a map from, we pick a, we pick a vector space and we pick a basis that is indexed by the set of elements. And then we obtain this map that is the representation. And we're effectively just passing the action through uh, the index, right? So uh, it, becomes, it becomes an act, the, the action becomes on the indices, right? And then we can sort of linearly extend on this basis and we get a representation of the group. Um, now, as I said, the representation is the map itself, but sometimes people sort of cheat by saying that the representation is just the vector space itself, right? So it'd be R3 in this case. Um, and so what that allows us to do is effectively consider groups as matrices through this map. And of course, then as I say here, we can employ all the tools of linear algebra. So on the one hand, we've got these neural networks, and on the other hand, we have these group representations. And we can, in some sense, combine them, right? So this is in the topic of the, uh, the title of the talk, where we now have these group equivariant neural networks. So I'll explain equivariance in a second. But now what we have is the data now lives in representations of a particular group G. So here, V and, v and W are representations. And we still have these learnable linear layers and the fixed nonlinear layers. But now the layers themselves become something called G equivariant. So formally, and I won't explain this, and you, know, you can read it here, but in words, what it really means is if I take my data, act upon it, and then pass it through a G equivariant map, it's the same as taking the data, passing it through the map, and then acting upon it, right? And these two things will be the same. That, that's what it says in words. Um, and again, for our purposes, we're going to be focused on the set of all linear G equivariant maps between V and W. And we'll use this notation here that you may have seen before, this HOM G notation. So if I'm talking about HOM G, I really mean this, the set of all linear G equivariant maps between two representations of a group. And in, particularly, uh, in particular, it's a, a vex space. Um, Okay, so you would have seen most of that before, I, I reckon. But here's the actual research problem. So 
again, we have another one of these sort of layer function diagrams, and I'll walk you through this. So the first thing to note is that we're taking this group GN, so some subgroup of GLN, right? So it could be the symmetric group, it could be the orthogonal group, uh, you know, and, and some other groups that we'll look at. But now the representations or the data lives in these high order tenses that we described. And these are representations of the group, which are given by the diagonal action over the tensor product, right? So here's a tensor product of vectors. And all this uh, representation is doing is, is doing matrix multiplication on each of the vectors in the tensor product. And so that, that's what we get there. And the key question that we're going to ask is really about these learnable linear layers. And the question is, can we characterize all of these possible GN equivariant learnable linear layers? So if we pick the standard basis, which is sort of a natural coordinate system to pick, can we find a basis or a spanning set for this HOM GN space, right? Because if we can find that, so we can take linear combinations of those basis or spanning set elements, and the coefficients will be our weights that we can optimize. And throughout, this is the entire question that we're going to look at. So you may think, why, why would this be interesting? Why would we want to do this? Well, from a practical perspective, less training data will be required. Uh, if you think about, for example, having five objects in a row and you wanted to learn something about fiveness, i.e. that there are five objects, with a standard neural network, you potentially have to put through many permutations of those five objects. If you took a permutation equivariant neural network, you, in theory, would have to put only one permutation through because the equivariants will learn all the different permutations, right? We're effectively baking the permutation symmetry into the network. So ultimately there will be less trained data required. Um, similarly, uh, to sort of convolutional neural networks, we'll see that there are high levels of parameter sharing or, or wait time. And that means that um, there'll be fewer parameters overall typically in a, in a typical network of this form. And so it should be easier to optimize. Um, and again, you know, one of the major problems with sort of neural network training is that we have to go and find an architecture that works for our problem. But of course, if we know what the, the layers are going to look like and you know, the data suits our problem, then there's going to be a lot less time required to actually find a neural network architecture because we just know what it looks like. And finally, this is a little bit more technical, but for people who know their representation theory, uh, you may be thinking, well, we have this representation space and why don't we just decompose it into irreducibles, right? That's typically what you do in representation theory. And then use something like Scher's lemma to find the possible maps between two such high order tensors. Well, there's sort of two answers to this. The first is that for many groups, we don't really know what the irreducible decomposition is because we don't know what the Klebsch Gordon coefficients are for those groups. Um, so that, that's the first point. And the second point is, even if you do know what they are, um, you're going to have to have a change of basis transformation, right? Because we picked the standard basis originally, and now we're going to have to change into this Fourier basis given by the irreducible decomposition. And that could be quite costly, especially when these are high order tensors. So if we can avoid doing that, we, we're going to get better networks. And, and Actually, what I'm going to show is that we can avoid doing that. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly show you a slide on some of the relevant literature that the work that I've done builds upon. And if you know things about uh, group aggravarian neural networks, you're probably familiar with these three papers. Um, but the first one was by Zahir and collaborators who introduced the first permutation equivariant neural network uh, called Deep Sets for learning from sets in a permutation equivariant manner. So in this situation, these would be one order tensors, right? K equals one. Um, this was then sort of improved upon by Maron and collaborators uh, who characterized these linear layers in the case for this symmetric group. Um, and they did it in the practical cases. So there's a specific condition on NKNL, 
Um, so K and L here are tensor orders. N is obviously the N related to SN. Um, and uh, specifically the condition is actually N is greater than or equals to K plus L. Um, and they did this by effectively using some nice uh, vector tricks, I would say, to solve uh, the symmetric subspace. They find the basis for this symmetric subspace. Um, and then finally we had Finzian collaborators who found a basis for three groups, the orthogonal group, the special orthogonal group, and the symplectic group um, for, the, for these lemmal linear layers. But their algorithm used a, was, was numerical. So uh, the issue with their algorithm is that they ran out of memory when they started increasing the size of n and when they started increasing the orders of the tensors, right, these k's. Um, and so really what we want to do is we want to find uh, an analytical solution to these problems, right? We want to find a base in all, or, or spanning set in all of these, you know, whatever values of n, k, and l, really. Um, and so that leads me to the results. So the first result is again on the symmetric group, right? So this is a slightly different method from the paper by uh, Maron and collaborators that we just discussed. And we have this triangle. So let me walk you through this. So here we have um, the learnable linear layers, right? This HOM SN space from a K order tensor to an L order tensor, right? This is exactly what we saw before. And we want to find a basis in this case. So if we go down the right-hand side, we can show by looking at some indices, and I, I won't go through this, but that it corresponds bijectively to the SN orbits on this particular set here. So the set of elements here are the L plus K length tuples, and in each position, we have the numbers one to N. Uh, so for example, I could have L plus K length tuples all with ones, right? Uh, would be an example uh, of a particular element in this space, in this set. Now, on the bottom arrow, there's, which is the one I will show you, there's also a correspondence between these orbits and the set partitions of L plus one to L plus K having at most N blocks. Okay, so right at the very start of this talk, I talked about set partitions of one to five, right? Having at most some number of blocks, right? Blocks being subsets in this case. And what we can do is we can represent these set partitions in terms of diagrams. Uh, and the diagrams have the following form. So here's an example. So we have L nodes at the top, K nodes at the bottom, and that corresponds to the K and L in the spaces, right? So you can imagine almost being like a map in some sense from the bottom to the top. And the blocks here, well, one and four are in the same block and two, three, and five are in the same block. So just to be absolutely clear, L would be three in this case and K would be two. And so, then, then there's this, obviously this final bit that I will show you with an example. But what this effectively means is, instead of looking at the orbits, we can sort of do away with that. And now just do, follow this combinatorial pattern, right? We can find all such set partitions that have this form and then correspond it to the basis in some way. And that's obviously very nice, uh, just to look at these diagrams. So let me show you quickly this bottom arrow here. So this looks a bit complicated, but again, I'll, I'll walk you through it. So here we have the set that I was talking about, these L plus K length tuples. And suppose we have some representative IJ, right, of an orbit. So now I'm taking an actual orbit under the SN action, and I can write this tuple like this, right? I with some index, right, of where the index runs from one through to L plus K. And we define the bijection as follows. So two numbers in our tuple are the same, if and only if their indices are in the same block, right, in the same subset of our set partition. So there are a few things to check, right? The first thing, of course, is that it's independent of the choice of class representative, which is clear, right? If two things are the same in our tuple and we act on it with SN, we're going to get two other things that are the same, right? And vice versa, of course. 
Um, so notice specifically as well that on the left hand side here, we're checking for an equality on the elements of one to n. Right? Those are the only possible values in our tuple. And on the right hand side, we're separating the indices into blocks. And so there must be at most n blocks, right, of this set partition of one to L plus k. And that gets you this bottom bijection here. So let me show you an example. Uh, I've got two examples actually here, just to make sure this uh, hits home. So let's look right at the top. So end S4, R4, just means the home space of S4 from R4 to R4, right? So in particular, we need to sort of pick off what the n, k, and l will be. So n here, because it's s4, it's going to be n equals 4. And the tensor powers, well, it's just r4. So it's going to be k equals 1 and l equals 1. Right? So by the diagram, if I just go back, we need all set partitions of 1 and 2, right? the set containing 1 and 2, having at most four blocks. Well, that's either this diagram here where they're in the same block or they're in different blocks. And those are the only possible such set partitions. And here we've got the actual set partitions labeled uh, in sort of uh, standard notation, right? But I prefer to think of these as diagrams, typically. And now there are really two ways of sort of finding the standard basis element, right? The first way, which is, the, I suppose, the more formal way, is to label the blocks in some way. So to find the actual class representative of our orbit. And that's done by, first of all, taking the block that contains the number one and labeling that as block one, and then finding the smallest index that's not in block one and labeling that block block two and going on, right? And then running the action of SN over this element. And that will get you all the orbit, uh, members of the orbit, and then, it's just going to be the sum of those EIJ, right? Some of these EIJ, and you get the identity in this case. Uh, the other way that I, which is the much preferred way I think of doing this, for, in my view, is as follows. So you take your row tuple, say here there's only one element in the tuple, and place it at the top row. You take your column tuple and place it on the bottom row. And then you see whether they match according to the pattern or not. So if you think about that, that's going to work because if it's a map going from bottom to top, it's going to be sort of the column, it's going to be sort of matrix multiplication, right? The column to the row type thing here. So um, let's take an example, right? So if I play, take the one one entry, I'm going to place one at the top and one at the bottom, and they're tied right, by the pattern, and one and one are the same. So I'm going to put a one in this cell. But if I take one and three, I'm going to place one at the top and three at the bottom. But one and three are different, but I need them to be the same under this diagram, right? There's a line between them. So I'm going to put a zero in the one, three cell. So again, by looking at all the entries, I'm going to get the identity. Here, I'm going to get all the off diagonal elements by the same process. And ultimately, this is the basis, right? There are only two elements in the basis of this space. So just to reinforce that, uh, and I, I won't go through all of it again, but um, here's a different example. So now we have n equals 2, k equals 2, and l is 1. So I want all set partitions of 1 to 3 having at most two blocks. And I want l nodes at the top, i.e. one node at the top, and two nodes at the bottom, k nodes at the bottom. So I'm only going to get these four set partitions. Notice specifically that the set partition uh, where one, two, and three are in separate blocks, right? There are no lines between any of them, does not appear here, right? Because that, that would have three blocks, but we only want at most two blocks because n is two. And by doing the same thing, by putting our row and column, we can see that, for example, with this one, they're going to get the one, one, one entry is going to be one, and the two, two, two is going to be one. And you can do the same thing throughout for all of them. And that gets you a basis of this particular space. So just to sort of stay where this, these ideas come from, um, 
they come really from work that appeared in statistical mechanics actually in the late 90s. So looking at something called the Shervale duality between the partition algebra and the group algebra of the symmetric group. Um, and, and this was sort of first introduced by in a series of papers by Paul Martin. And then Vaughan Jones found a subjective homomorphism from the partition algebra. So the partition algebra uh, is, a, is an algebra that it has, that has a basis where of diagrams where you have k nodes at the top and k nodes at the bottom. And it's just the set partitions of one to two k in sort of diagrammatic form. And jo jo uh, Jones found this subjective homomorphism from the partition algebra onto the centralizer algebra of a k order tensor of Rn. So that would be the HOM SN space from a K order tensor to a K order tensor. And then this work was sort of used by Ben Cardin and Howison to construct the invariant theory of the symmetric group, which if you think a little bit about it, kind of makes a bit of sense because uh, the HOM SN space sits inside a, a generic HOM space. And in fact, it's the invariant sub-representation. So you could potentially see why that might be possible to find to sort of construct it from these from from this partition algebra effectively. Okay, so that's the first result, and now here's the second one. Similar sort of ideas, but very different in approach. So there are three groups here, um, and for the first, so now now instead of so again we've got this linear layer here, right? But instead of having a basis, we're now interested in finding a spanning set, and. This first arrow, which is what I'll show you, uh, well, I'll show you probably all of that actually, but th this first arrow here is about using an invariant argument, which I will show you, and um, something called the first fundamental theorem for the group, where you can, effectively what happens is you can, you're pulling the tensor across the corner, right? Uh, and then from this bottom arrow, you have a, a correspondence between the span set you get from this space to now set partitions again of one to L plus K, but the blocks now come in pairs, right? So here again, L at the top is three, K at the bottom is three, one and four are in the same block, two and three are in the same block and five and six are in the same block. So notice specifically as well that we can pair across, you know, our rows of vertices, right? We don't always have to go from top to bottom or bottom, to, uh, top to bottom or bottom to top. And then again, we're going to get a correspondence this way, projected correspondence. And there's a similar result for SOM, right? So similar thing down the right-hand side, but now the correspondence across the bottom, um, not only do you have these ones that come in pairs, but also you have set partitions of one to L plus K, where now we remove N elements. So this N links to the SOM. So we remove N elements and then pair the rest up. So we take this diagram here, L and K will both be three. We've removed two and four, right, from the set of one to six, paired one and six together, and paired three and five together. And you can find more on this in, in this paper. So how does it work? So again, this is looking quite messy, but um, we have our desired space here, right? Here's our OM GN space. And imagine that we have a, an element C in this space and we pick some basis of Rn, right? Can be any basis. Then we can express C in terms of, as a linear combination of matrix units, right? Of, of the home space without the GN. And here are the coefficients. So we want to find these coefficients really. Now this argument, which comes from Richard Brower. So there's a paper in 1937 um, that's, where, where this argument has been adapted from, and I'll talk about that more later, um, where you can find these coefficients by effectively constructing another invariant, right? So an invariant for this group, GN, for a map of this form. So we're mapping an L plus K order tensor to a zero order tensor. And here's a L plus K length vector, you know, two, uh, L plus K tensor to, uh, vector, right? So each of these is a vector in Rn. And we're, we're going to map it to this nasty looking sum. Now, there are a few things to note about this particular sum. The first thing is that just take just take a term in the sum. Firstly, 
a component from each vector appears in this product, right? This sort of this, this, this overall product here, right? We pick one from each. And then across the sum, all combinations of components where we take one from each appear, if you look very closely. And thirdly, it's polynomial in all of the components. So really what we're doing is the relation is between, we're gonna find this, and then we're finding a relationship between these, these products of components and this EIJ. So if we know what the coefficients are in this sum, we can immediately say what the coefficient is up here, and then we know what the matrix is. So that's a little technical, I suppose. Um, but we have to combine it. So to find these coefficients for each of these groups, we combine it with something called the first fundamental theorem for each group. So here's the first fundamental theorem for the orthogonal group. Again, a bit technical, but we'll get the basic points that, so with Rn, you can associate to it a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. And if you pick the standard basis for Rn, this form actually becomes the Euclidean inner product on Rn, right? So just the standard dot product. And now suppose we have a function, right? From an L plus, plus K order tensor uh, to a zero order tensor, right? So of the desired form that we wanted from that invariant argument, that's polynomial. Well, that's good because uh, it was, and it's O-N invariant, which is also what we want. Then it must be polynomial in these Euclidean inner products where we pair two U's together, we pair a U and a V together, and we pair two V's together, right? In terms of pairing, in terms of the form. So recalling from the previous slide that we wanted a, each component, right? A component from each of these vectors appeared and all combinations appeared. This means that we can actually combine the two arguments and get a spanning set for our L plus K order to a zero order. And it's just a product of bilinear forms where now we have you know, one to L plus K vectors and we just take all possible permutations, right? But each of these is a, is a form. So of course you may notice, right? That if L plus K is odd, there's no such spanning set, right? So we need, we need it to be even. Um, so, so that's it. So the, the question is how to really find the matrices. Now, I've shown you all the technical arguments and I'll show you how to do it technically, but we also want to sort of do away with the technical stuff and just look at the diagrams like with the symmetric group. So here's our example. We have, again, this endomorphism space, right? But this is just staying. So we've got N is two, K is two and L is two. So the first thing we can do, so let's do it from the inner product way. So we want to find all possible products of inner products where we're pairing a U, you know, we have four vectors, U1, U2, V1, V2. We want to find all possible permutations where we paired them up. So that gets you these three. Now, one thing we can do is we can represent the inner product by a set partition diagram. So how, how's that done? Well, we place our U vectors on the top row and our V vectors on the bottom row, and then draw a line if and only if they are in the same form, right? So U1 and U2 in the same form, so we pair them here, and V1 and V2 in the same form, so we pair them here. So if we take this one, U1 and V1 are in the same form, so we pair down, and U2 and V2 in the same form, so we pair down as well. Now, the other way, so to find the Spanish set element, uh, so go this way now, we can just expand this because we've picked the um, standard basis, right? We, we said from the very beginning, we're gonna pick the standard basis for Rn. So these forms become the inner product. And if you expand this out, for example, you're gonna get terms like U11, U12, V11, V12. So picking off the coefficients, right, if I just sort of show you here, picking off these indices here, that's going to correspond, that, that basically saying that term appears in this sum. So we're going to have a one in this position, and that means a one in this position of our matrix, right? Specifically in the one, 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 one entry. So that's the one, 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 one entry is going to have a one. And if you take all of the elements, you're going to get this matrix, right, in these particular entries. And you can do it for these other ones, and you're going to get these matrices. Now, if you had to do this all the time, it'd be a bit frustrating, right? So the other way to do it is to, so this is the technical way and that's the, effectively the proof. Um, 
the, the other way to do it, of course, is to take all possible set partitions that have uh, blocks as pairs, right? So they drop this column and we just find it combinatorially. And we do the same thing as before. We take our row tuple and put it at the top, our uh, column tuple and put it at the bottom and see if it matches the pattern, right? So one and one and one and one, well, they match. So we're gonna put a one there. Uh, you know, but it's, for example, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, well, they're not, one and two are not the same, right? So we're gonna put a zero in that particular position and we can do it like that. So effectively what I'm trying to say is we don't have to go through all of the inner product work to get the answer. You can just look at these combinatorial diagrams. Now, uh, there's also other results, right, for SPM and SOM. So I'll, I'll go through this a little quicker, just for time. But um, SPN, there, there's a there's a there's a different form now. So there's also a skew symmetric form, right, which has these sort of angle brackets, and one can show that there's something called the symplectic basis, which has a slightly different indexing. So first of all, I should say that it's n has to be two m, and that's because it's non-degenerate. Uh, the form, and there's a theorem you can go and look up called Jacobi's theorem that will show you why that's true. Um, and so the basis itself is indexed slightly differently. It has these one and one dash, all the way up to m and m dash. Um, but it's just going to be standard if you pick the symmetric form, which we will do as well. This basis would just be standard, but it's just got a different indexing. And this basis has satisfied some relations with respect to the skew symmetric form. So specifically, if you take two vectors that are both non-dashed or two vectors that are dashed, you get, uh, and take their, their, their skew product effectively, you get a zero. Uh, but if you, if you take one that's not dashed and dashed and dashed and not dashed, you're going to get a plus minus of a Kronecker delta, depending on the order. And you can show that this inner product, uh, not this inner product, this, uh, this bilinear form, sorry, becomes the skew product, where it looks like an inner product, but now we have this extra sort of term in front, right? Uh, this extra coefficient in front. So again, this is also looking complicated. So as I said, if you actually pick the symmetric form with respect to R and the, the, with that basis, uh, this form would be the dot product. So what the theorem actually says with that sort of setup, what the theorem actually says for SBN is, again, we have another one of these functions from an L plus K order tensor to a zero order tensor. It's polynomial and it's SPN invariant. Then it must be polynomial in the Euclidean inner products where you're now pairing a U and a V, so with the open brackets, and then with the angle brackets, you're pairing two U's and two V's. And so again, by applying this invariant argument where we had to have one component from each vector, we get this, again, this looks pretty nasty, but all it's saying is take products of either inner or skews uh, and all possible permutations. And it's either inner if um, we're pairing a U and a V or a V and a U, or it's skew if we're pairing two U's and two V's. And so again, if we take the same example, but now we're looking at SP2 equivariance, um, we can find all, all the products again, do the same thing as I said before, or um, we can look at these diagrams and then find the, the Spanish state element. But notice here that the only one that's changed from the previous example is this top line. And that's because these are now skew products. And so how to find these elements? Well, either the formal way, which is to expand the skew products and, and apply the relations uh, that I presented here, and you pick off the appropriate entries. Or alternatively, what you can do is um, put the you know the, the rows and the columns again on the on the diagram, uh, and effectively see if, and effectively see if they match according to these according to these relations, right? So, for example, uh, let's just look at this one quickly. The one one dash. Let's look at this one. The one one dash one dash one. So the one one dash. Okay, back here is e one e one dash. Well, that's going to give me a plus one. And a one dash one is going to give me a minus one. So I need the product of those two things. So it's going to be minus one in this cell. And again, I get a spanning set for this particular space. And finally, there's another uh, first one I'm going to for SON, where it's similar to ON. So you get these 
uh, polyno use polynomial in these um, inner products, but also you now have to consider n by n subdeterminants of this matrix, where the matrix has all the vectors as its columns. And again, if you apply the same arguments as before, you're going to get the, fir the first type of set partition that I showed you, but also the other one where we effectively removed n elements, right? It's going to correspond to one where we've moved n elements, so we make that a determinant, and then we just pair the rest up. So I won't show you this example but uh, for time, but uh, just to explain that, of course, uh, n will be 2, k is 3, and l is 1. Uh, this, this here is going to be very similar, right? We're going to find all the ones that are pairs, and then there are going to be six other ones where we've removed two elements from our diagram. Let's just take this one for a quick example uh, and take the 1, 1, 1, 2. So I'm going to put 1 at the top, 1, 1, 2 at the bottom. Now, 1 and 1 are paired, so that's good. And uh, 1, 2, uh, well, what this is going to correspond to is the determinant of the matrix that has E1 in the first column and E2 in the second column by this sort of work here. And of course, that's a determinant of our identity. So it's going to be plus 1. If you flip the one and the two around, as you can see here, uh, that's effectively swapping the columns of the matrix. So you're going to get a minus one coming from the determinant. And you can just follow this through for all the possible diagrams. So this work comes from Brouwer, really. So as I said earlier, he came up with this argument, but he did it for the centralized algebra. Right. So again, this endomorphism space from a k order to a k order tends to this equivariant to one of these groups. And then Shell Grude, much later on, uh, studied the representation theory of something called the Brouwer Grude algebra. So it was span it, it's where you have k nodes at the top and k nodes at the bottom, uh, but it's spanned by both of those purple and green diagrams, effectively. Uh, and that's related to the representation theory of SOM. So I wanted to get into this one, which is the alternating group, because this is where jellyfish appear. Uh, and hopefully you're still following me. Um, but at last, you might say. Um, now, so here what we have is the following. We have a, it's very similar to the symmetric group, but different. And of course, everything's in the different bit of this, where here we have our linear layer. And uh, we want a basis, but now we want an, right? Alternating group. So just to be clear, the alternating group is the subgroup of the symmetric group consisting of all even permutations, right? By the same argument as for SN, you can show there's a bijective correspondence this way, it gets you the A n orbits of this set again, right? The L plus K length tuples, where the elements are one to N in each position. Now on the bottom, it's slightly different. So you may recall for the symmetric group, we considered all set partitions of one to L plus K having at most N blocks. Well, we're doing the same thing here, but now, depending on how many blocks there are, they either correspond to one a n orbit or two a n orbits, right? So as I said, if they're n minus two blocks, they correspond to one a n orbit, and consequently to one basis vector in the space. If they're n minus one or n blocks, they correspond to two orbits and to two basis vectors. So the point here is that you're going to now get set partition diagrams, right? So we're going to take the diagram form that correspond to more than one basis vector in this space. And the question is how to find those basis elements, right? So just some terminology quickly. If it corresponds to more than one orbit or one basis vector, we're gonna say that that set partition splits. Uh, if it doesn't split, right? So up to N minus two blocks, then we just find the basis elements exactly the same way as for the symmetric group that I showed you earlier. Right? But to find the ones that split, we need to use these things called jellyfish. Right, so they're called jellyfish because they look like them, right? We have this blue head and we have N legs, so N nodes, and they're connecting to this blue head that sort of represents nothing in some way. Now, formally, what this corresponds to is the determinant map from an N order tensor to a zero order tensor. And it's defined on the standard basis, right, of this space as follows. Here's your, here's your uh, N order tensor. And all we do is just make the vectors the, uh, the columns, right? Make the vectors the columns and then take the determinants. 
Now, there are two things you may want to notice about this map, right? The first thing is that whilst this map itself is linear, of course, the determinant of a matrix is not linear, right? So there's a distinction about the linearity. The other point to notice is that this map is an equivariant, but it's not SN equivariant. So the question is why? So um, if you had a transposition, we acted on this with the transposition, right? That effectively is going to swap two vectors in your matrix on the right-hand side. And that's going to introduce a minus sign right to the overall determinant of the original. Uh, so, of course, uh, the elements in the alternating group, right, are even permutations. So you're going to get minus one to some power that's, a, you know, multiple of two. So it will be an equivariant, but it won't be SN equivariant because you're going to get that minus sign coming out. So that's important because we're going to use this jellyfish on those ones where they do split to define the basis vectors. So just to recap from before, and I won't go through it again, but here's the example for S2, right? From K equals two to L equals one. We had these set partitions of one to three, where we had two nodes at the bottom, one node at the top, right? And we found these basis vectors in the standard way, putting the rows and columns at the bottom and just seeing where they match the pattern. The question now is what happens if we change this to A2, right? So the alternating group, still K is two and L is one. So there's this general procedure that I'll walk you through, uh, which works as follows. So we take all the set partitions, right? In the SN case, right? And that's just because, as I said before, we're still looking at all set partitions of one to L plus K that have at most N blocks. And now we need to decide whether they split or whether they don't. So as I say here, all of them split, right? If I go back, the ones that split are going to have, because N is two, they're going to be either one, N minus one, one, or two blocks, right, that split. This is one block, two blocks, two blocks, two blocks. So these all split. Now, if, if you have one that didn't split, you just find the basis matrix in the same way as for the symmetric group case, right? But now, for each one that does split, so I, I won't, Here's, the, here's the, uh, the wording of it, but it's better, to, I think, to show you what happens. This is what we do. Take our second example set partition that splits. So we're going to take this one here, where one and two are paired together in the same block and three. Block. The first thing we can do is pull, so the first thing we do is pull the nodes in the top row down to the bottom, keeping their order. All right, so just forget about this jelly fish for a second. I've pulled the top down and I've got a one, two paired together and a three on its own. The next thing I do is I attach, or rather I place N nodes corresponding to my AN on top. And then I pair the blocks in order to the nodes at top, right? So in order means take the block containing the lowest numbered vertex at each stage, right? So here's gonna be, here's the lowest, this has one, so this is block one, pair it to vertex one. Now I need to find the lowest number of vertex not in block one, well that's three, and pair it here to this second vertex. And you may note if, uh, if this only has N minus one blocks, for example, we're just going to leave the last node free. We're not gonna have any pairing in this green section. And then what we do is we attach the jellyfish head on top to these N nodes. So diagrammatically, we have this, this jellyfish diagram, but this is gonna correspond to an AN equivariant map, in fact, from an L plus K order tensor to a zero order tensor through the N order tensor, right? Uh, that's AN equivariant. So I said this top bit was AN equivariant. Now, now this, this bit is also AN equivariant. In fact, it's actually SN equivariant, which means it's AN equivariant because of course AN is a subgroup of SN. So the question is why? Well, in this diagram, I now have N nodes at the top and I have L plus K nodes at the bottom. So I have a set partition of one to L plus K plus N, right? But it has at most N blocks by construction. So because it has at most N blocks, it must correspond to an SN equivariant map from an L plus K order tensor to an N order tensor. 
So it's SN equivariant, which means it's AN equivariant, and that you can show the composition of two AN equivariant maps as AN equivariant. So that's the first point to make. The second point is it does something very nice on the original elements of your orbit, right? So remember, this corresponded to an SN orbit in an, you know, this L plus K length tuple, right? And one can show that it takes elements of that orbit, right, where so you, you index a standard basis vector by an element of that orbit and map it through this diagram. And it's going to either map to plus or minus one. And for anything that's not in the original orbit, it's going to map to zero. So what that effectively means is we can use the plus or minus one values to split our original SN orbit into two AN orbits, which is sort of what I say here. Right? So for the specific example that I've just shown you, the, the SN orbit, the S2 orbits, right, corresponded to these two, uh, these two elements, right, these two tuples. Well, why? Because if we look at this diagram again, it's going to be one and one need to be paired together and two on its own. And it's going to be two and two paired together and one on its own. But now we flattened it. So it's going to be one, one, two, one, one, two, 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 one. And so let's see what happens with the first one, for example. So I've got this E, the standard basis vector, E of E1 tends to E1 tends to E2. So by the connection here, it's going to map to E1, and this one's going to map to E2. So it's going to be E1 tends to E2. And then I'm going to apply the determinant map, which takes E1 and E2 as separate columns and applies the determinant. Well, the determinant is uh, the, of the identity is one, right? So it's going to map. 1, 1, 2 to plus 1. You can do a similar thing for the other one, and it's going to map it to minus 1. And so effectively what happens is the S2 orbit gets split into two A2 orbits, which is what we sort of said would happen. But they just happen to have, the orbits just happen to have one element in each of them, right? And to find the matrices themselves, you just reshape this, right? You reshape this into the correct form, effectively pulling this is like pulling the, the nodes up to the top again, or you know, just applying the correct bracket in the, uh, the, the delimited in the right place, and take a sum of the of the matrix units indexed by the elements of the individual orbits. But of course, because there's one element in each orbit, it's just going to be the matrix units themselves. And you do this for each each uh, separation that splits, right? So ultimately you're going to get this. So here was our example that I've just shown you, and here are the two matrices. This is E112, and this is E221. And if you do it for the other ones, you're going to get two matrices each. So you're going to get a basis of eight elements for this space. So one further thing to note, I'd say, is that if you change N, right? So let's increase N to say three, right? First of all, you're going to get an A3. You're going to get R3 still 10 to two times, and you're going to get an R3 here, right? Now I need to take the set partitions of one to three, having at most three blocks. So the first thing is I'm going to introduce this new set partition down here diagram where one, two, and three are in separate blocks. But now the, whether a set partition splits or not has changed, right? Because I only want N minus one and N. So N, if n is three, of course, n minus one is going to be two and n is three. So it's going to be these bottom three with the new one. They're going to split. But this top one now will not split. So the basis vector will be the same as for S3. So I'm going to get nine basis vectors in that case. So what I'm trying to say here is that depending on the values of n, k, and l, uh, things will split or not split. Right. Uh, Actually, depending on the value of n, really, where things will split or not split, right? Um, and this work really comes from two people, or was adapted from two people, let's say. The first is Bloss, Matthew Bloss, who looked at, just like Jones with a symmetric group and looking at the centralized algebra, he looked at the case for the alternating group. But the work was redone really by Combs. Um, read a pure maths paper looking at an equivariance using category theory. Now, category theory is not the easiest thing for machine learning people to understand. I say typically there are very few papers that link the two. Um, so, you know, this is one sense why this paper is quite nice. I'd say the other point is that I find a different basis to codes, right? 
uh, here we find something called the orbit basis, and he finds what you could probably call the diagram basis. Um, so there, there are differences there. Um, and so, so here are some other papers that I've looked at, uh, that I've written. Um, so I talked about category theory now, and the fact that category theory, there are not many papers in machine learning with category theory. Well, there are actually advantages to taking a category theoretic setup. So this first paper here uh, puts a category theoretic framework around the work that I've just shown you. And so what that really means is if you pick the right functors, um, specifically monoidal functors, and I won't go into that too much, um, you can treat the diagrams as matrices. So I've shown you these set partition diagrams. You can treat, you can sort of play with these diagrams in place of the matrices, right? So I sort of talked about pulling nodes down to the bottom. I can also yank strings. I can treat these lines as strings effectively. Um, and that's actually quite nice because if you take that work uh, and apply it to these Brouwer group equivariant neural network layers, right? So that's the orthogonal group, the special orthogonal group, and the symplectic group, and you start pulling nodes around, you can actually find a quicker algorithm in which to compute with these linear layers than just taking sort of the arbitrary standard approach. Um, and that takes advantage of using chronicle product matrices. So if you're interested, I encourage you to go and look at that paper. Um, I will close now with some final remarks about practicality and limitations, because I think it's also important to talk about these things uh, as well. Now, I've talked very theoretically, right? So practicality and practically, there are potentially some issues at the moment surrounding limitations of hardware, right? I have these K order tensors. And of course, as I increase the size of K, the space is increasing exponentially. So this means that actually storing the data in these, uh, in these spaces is going to be difficult. And for, even for low orders, you need to do some sort of amazing engineering work, which is shown by this paper by uh, Condor and collaborators, where they develop custom CUDA kernels to implement their networks. So that's potentially one issue at the moment, but you know, as, as with all these things, and maybe we shouldn't solely rely on this, but hardware typically does improve. And you may have seen DeepMind's AlphaFold, right? Which use equivariant neural networks and involve three order tensors. So we expect high order tensors to increase, uh, to, to be more prevalent. And as they increase, they should be more prevalent in, uh, you know, in, in the networks that we use, right? Um, but even for now, one advantage of this method, of course, is that the dimension of the spaces is very small, typically, right? The HOM G space sitting inside a HOM space is typically a much smaller dimension. Uh, and these matrices are also quite sparse, right? So because they're a smaller dimension and they're sparse, there's the wait time that I talked about, and there are fewer matrices to store, uh, fewer elements in the matrix to store, right? So Ultimately, it should be possible to compute with the actual matrices that we found. Um, it's just a matter of the data and, and where it's stored and how to store it. Um, and so with that, I'll end my talk there and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much for listening.